And so it's been really fun to hear about Jesus as priest and prophet and now king. And so, um, yeah, so I'm really excited to be up here and to share a few things with you. And so uh, I'll begin with Jesus is king. So the gospel, basically the essence of the Christian faith and theology can be summed up with three words. Christ is Lord. And Jesus is Lord is basically another way of saying that Jesus is king. The reality to which this three-word phrase points is at the very heart of Christianity, and I would argue it's at the very heart of the universe. And so understanding what it means that Jesus is king is massively important. And this is such a massive massive topic that I'm going to have to be really selective, and I'm going to be really selective. And so what we're going to do, basically, I'm going to tackle the topic of Jesus as king through this three-part genealogy. We're going to look at Adam, we're going to look at Jesus, and then we're going to look at ourselves. And this is basically what I'm going to argue. This is a very big, broad overview of my talk. Three words, three emojis, okay? If you kind of get this, this is, you know, you'll know where I'm going. Adam thumbs down, Jesus thumbs up, us thumbs up. So that's basically what we're going to be doing. So first, we're going to start talking about Adam, and I'm going to do a pretty broad overview of Genesis 1 through 3, and we're going to look at God's intentions for creation and how we, how Adam and Eve, messed it up. And so we'll begin at the beginning, and we're going to start with Genesis 1, and I want to show you that humans were created to be kings and queens. So many of you are familiar with Genesis 1, I know that, and I imagine that for a few of you, Genesis 1 might be new, might be foreign territory. And I want to show you that humans are the climax of creation. Now, Genesis 1 is an ancient Near Eastern poem, so it's pretty foreign to most of us just because of that. And the point of the poem is not to answer, not to provide answers to modern scientific questions like uh, how God created the world. The point is to explain why he created it. And so the key to unlocking the purpose for everything in creation, why God created things, is really to see how the days relate to one another. And so I'm quickly going to rehearse what God created each of the six days. Uh, There's seven days of creation, but we're really going to look at the first six. And so it's a poem. There's a particular rhythm and cadence. There's repetition and there's structure to it, and it's all really important. And I'm going to argue that What uh, Moses was doing when he was writing this is um, not so much talking about the chronology of creation, but the logic behind it. And so, um, I'm going to read just kind of the very first day, just so you get a feel for how things go, and then I'm going to give us an overview of all six days and how they fit together. So basically, there's a lot of repetition. There's a lot of, and God said, and it was so... Uh, And then it says, uh, God called whatever it was that he made good. And then there's morning, there was evening, the first day. That's just kind of how it goes, day one through six, with a few more details thrown in. So for the first day, it said, And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that the light was good. And God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning, the first day. The second day, does anyone remember what God made on the second day? Sort of the sea, sky and water. He separated the sky and the water, the heavens and the water. Day three, he separated, he had the earth emerge from the waters, right? So he separated land and the waters, and then on the land there was the vegetation. So that's days one through three. Day four, does anyone remember day four? What's that? Sun, moon, and stars. I hear Scott, he knows what's going on. He gets paid to know that. Day five... The birds and the fishes. I like the pluralized fish with the ES. And day six, he created the land animals and humans. And so charting it out this way, I think, helps us to see how the sort of the logical relation of what God created to one another. So how do you all think these things relate to one another? Throw out some ideas. And if you already know this, this is for my, uh, somehow, like, my slides got leaked, so my... The guys in my Bible course are like hating on me for some, some repetition, but it's always good to hear thing, good things over again. So uh, if you already know the answer, don't spoil it for everybody else. But how do you guys think these things relate to one another? Throw out some ideas. Okay, there's some separation on days one through three, definitely. What about column, the, the column on the left and the column on the right? Give you a hint. Okay, yeah. 
Yeah, exactly. So one way of looking at it is on the left, days one through three is the habitations. And then days four through six are the inhabitants. That's definitely, so occupies is one way of putting it. That's absolutely true, true enough. But I think it gets even more specific. And the real interpretive key is where God, God gives us some clues in days four and day six. So I'm going to read a little bit more about what God said when he made days four and six. And then I think this will give us a little bit more insight into how uh, the right and left columns relate to each other and essentially what it, the purpose of humanity is. So for day four, this is Genesis 1, 16 to 18. It says, and God made the two great lights. So he's talking about the sun and the moon, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. And he also made the stars. And God set them in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth, to rule over the day and over the night and to separate the light from the darkness. And so habitations and inhabitants, but even more specifically, I think we're supposed to understand these things as realms and rulers. And this reaches its climax with the creation of humans. And this is what it says in Genesis 1, 26 to 28. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every creeping thing on the earth. And God blessed them, and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. So realms and rulers is a really good way of understanding how these things relate to each other. And humans are the climax of creation. It says that they're made in the image of God. And I think how we're supposed to understand the image of God, it's not so much a physical thing like we look like God or some sort of existential thing like we have souls and the other animals and plants uh, don't, even though I think that's true. I think the way we're supposed to understand being made in the image of God is a a functional way. So we're supposed to have dominion. We're supposed to serve as vice regents. Uh, Eugene asked for a fancy word. That's kind of a fancy word. I don't know. Maybe that satisfies you, Eugene. Vice regents. We're vice kings, so to speak. So we're kings and queens in God's place. God has installed us there to act um, like God would uh, if he was in the world. And to be sure, God is the ultimate king with a capital K. But you and I, all humans, are supposed to be little kings and little queens, stewards, as it were, whose task it is to rule over creation as God would. Genesis 2 summarizes our job description, and it also provides the very first prohibition. So I'll read a little bit of Genesis 2, 15 and 17. So it says, The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and to keep it. And that's basically the summary of what humans were supposed to do. They were supposed to work the ground, and the word for working the ground was basically, it's the same word to serve, to serve the ground, to take care of it, to steward it well, and we're supposed to keep it. When I took seminary classes, uh, Hebrew classes in seminary, the word for keep it is shamar, and the way I remember this was I I connected it with samurai, shamurai, like they guard things. So we're supposed to watch over the garden to preserve it, to, um, to guard it. So basically, we're supposed to work it and to keep it. Adam and Eve were essentially gardeners, whose job it was to uh, faithfully steward creation as it progresses from garden to city. And the type of gardeners I want you to think about are sort of the organic co-op farmers, not factory farmers. So the key word here is dominion, not domination. And then Genesis 2, 15 to 17, it goes on to express the first prohibition. It says, and the Lord God commanded the man saying, you may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. So that's the first prohibition. Pretty simple. Eat this, don't eat that, right? Though God surely created the world for himself, he did in a way create the world for humans, for us. The flourishing of humanity and creation as a whole depended upon humans fulfilling their calling as humans to be kings and queens. And so what we see in the first two chapters of Genesis is that Adam and Eve are installed in the garden as kings and queens. And the rest of human history is supposed to be them faithfully reigning as kings and queens under God, but over creation, exercising dominion over creation, obeying God, honoring God, by making families, cultivating the earth, developing culture, helping all of creation flourish. But it didn't take very long for creation to fall from order to disorder. 
That takes us to Genesis 3, where we read about the failure of humanity as God's vice regents, where everything went wrong. So what I want to do is read uh, a section of Genesis 3, the fall, and uh, I want you to have Genesis, uh, the creation order of Genesis 1 in your mind, how God set up the world to function. And as I read Genesis 3, 1 through 13, I want you to try to listen for the reversal of the creation order. So listen for what happens. And you can follow along on the screen. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God actually say, you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate, and she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to man and said to him, where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. He said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, The woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me the fruit of the tree, and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this that you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. So here's a creation order generally. This is what we get from Genesis 1. God created things. He's on top. And man is underneath God, humanity, ruling and reigning over animals and the vegetation. And what we see in Genesis 3 is a complete reversal of the creation order. So everything is flipped upside down. So there's a serpent, right, um, sort of pointing to this uh, vegetation. The things that mankind is supposed to rule over now rule over human beings. Um, The serpent sort of takes, uh, offers a piece of fruit to humanity and uh, everything is turned upside down. So basically what sin does is turns the world upside down. Sin is essentially the exaltation of self and the rejection of God. And what follows after what I just read in Genesis 3 is basically a threefold curse that God pronounces that corresponds to the relationships um, that constitute created order. And so God created, basically all of life is about relationships. We're supposed to be in right relationship with God, with one another, sort of on the horizontal plane, and then over creation. And what we see uh, right after sin is that uh, the relationship between God and humanity is severed, right? They're hiding from God. They're afraid of God. And then you start, you see the blame casting between husband and wife. And then when God's pronouncing the curses, he, he says the ground is cursed because of what you've done. So basically, uh, creation is cursed because of sin. And so in their disobedience, Adam and Eve exalted themselves above God and functionally rejected him as their king. And so the clash of kingdoms begins. Anyone in Hume up in, up in here? Do you guys take any, any Hume people? I know Jack is. Any other people? No Humeys? Okay, there's a few of you over here. So you guys might be familiar with this. So in his book, The City of God, Augustine argues that human history is essentially a history of two cities. The city of God and the city of the world. The heavenly city and the earthly city. The earthly city, the kingdom of this world, is dominated by a love of self. And in the heavenly city, the kingdom of God is characterized by a love of God. And these two cities are, these two kingdoms are diametrically opposed to one another. And it's important to point out the difference between the earthly and the heavenly 
city is not that the earthly city is material uh, and in the present and that the heavenly city is uh, spiritual and in the future. One of my favorite philosophers, Jamie Smith, uh, points out that the beginning of the earthly city is not time and creation, but the fall. What characterizes the earthly city is disordered reality. And so the earthly city is basically a disordered rendition of creation. And as Augustine argues in the city of God, the earthly city and the heavenly city are in this present world commingled and entangled together. They exist side by side, and the two cities are at war. It's the kingdom or kingdoms of the world versus the kingdom of God. And every single human being, including each one of us, is either a citizen of the earthly city or the heavenly city. And citizenship in the earthly city is characterized by an exaltation of the self. And it's driven by a desire for power and domination, and it's achieved through violence. Citizens of the earthly city, their allegiance is to some cocktail of idols, to other kings, uh, some combination of self, success, money, power, pleasure, you name it. The citizenship in the heavenly city is characterized by a submission to God, not of exaltation of self, but a submission to God. And it's driven by a desire for power and dominion, the power and dominion that God has given humans, except this is achieved not through violence, but through love. And their allegiance is to God. And so human history is essentially a long, drawn-out reiteration of the earthly city against the city of God. And so here's one example. We see this really clearly in the story of the Tower of Babel from Genesis 11. Jason uh, Earls mentioned this last night. In this story, we read that humans were doing their human thing, right? They're just doing kind of what humans do. They're making families, building cities, using their God-given gifts and talents to settle and build things, developing and using technology. And this is what we read in Genesis 11. The people, the inhabitants of Babel, says, And they said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and bitumen for mortar. Apparently that's some high-tech stuff back in the day in Genesis 11. And then they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens. And so the, the tower with the top in the heavens, basically back in the day, there are all these ziggurats, is what they call them. They're like these pyramid structures. And they built them really high up because they believed God was in the sky. So if you build really high, you get closer to God. They were trying to basically be like God. And then they said, let us make a name for ourselves. N.T. Wright sums this up really well. He says, Humans, even after the disaster of Genesis 3, simply can't help planting gardens and creating communities. It's in their DNA as God's image bearers. It's simply what we do as humans. The problem is not now is not that they now do these things and oh sorry. The problem is that they now do these things and much else besides with a fatal twist of self-serving arrogance, producing at best one parody after another of the ultimate garden city, the new Jerusalem. So you see, the problem here isn't so much in what they're doing, it's why they're doing it. God made men and women to plant gardens and to create communities to put their time, talents, and treasure to use. The question becomes, are they doing it to exalt themselves or to exalt God? By and large, human history is marked by the former, by an exaltation of self, by a greed for power and pleasure and possessions, achieved through domination and through violence that perpetuates the disordered creation, the disorder of fallen creation. Mark Twain, a 19th century author that I'm sure many of you are familiar with, provides some really uh, insightful things into the human condition and some pretty dark stuff. So he uh, did a scientific study at the London Zoological Gardens And he basically observed humans, and he um, compared the traits and dispositions to animals at the zoo uh, to the traits and dispositions of uh, human beings. And so what he said is, after his experiments, he renounced his allegiance to the Darwinian theory of uh, the ascent of mankind from the lower animals, and he exchanged it for a truer theory, which he called the descent of mankind from the higher animals. So he did things like compare how humans were with money compared to like a squirrel who 
Uh, even though it might uh, hoard some acorns for itself in the winter so it could get through, he didn't take more than he would need, and he wouldn't really steal it from his fellow squirrels, right? He just stored it up but so that he could live and survive. But humans aren't like that. They're, he said, avaricious and miserly, which we would say uh, greedy and cheap. He said, man is the only animal that harbors insults, harbors injuries, and broods over them and waits until a chance presents itself and then takes revenge. He says, of all the animals, man is the only one that is cruel. He is the only one that inflicts pain for the pleasure of doing it. It is a trait that is not known to the higher animals. Man is the cruel animal. He is alone in that distinction. He goes on to say, the higher animals engage in individual fights, but never in organized masses. Man is the only animal that deals in that atrocity of atrocities, war. He's the only one that gathers his brethren about him and goes forth in cold blood and with calm pulse to exterminate his kind. He's the only animal that for sordid wages will march out and help to slaughter strangers of his own species who have done him no harm and with whom he has no quarrel. It's pretty brutal, but it's even worse than Twain imagines. Humans not only wage war against one another, but they wage war against their creator, and they're the only creatures that do that. Things are bad, and you don't have to be a Christian to see that things are bad. In fact, unless you're a nihilist, and you can't really be a nihilist for too long, everyone acknowledges that things are pretty jacked up. Simply put, things are not as they ought to be. And the solution to, that, to the brokenness is disputable, but the problem really isn't. And Christians give that problem a name. We call it sin. And sin is like a terrible congenital disease passed from parents to children, beginning with Adam and corrupting generation after generation. Every son of Adam and every daughter of Eve is born into and corrupted by original sin. In fact, G.K. Chesterton, a, writing for, a writer from the 19th century, he was an author and a theologian, he thought that original sin is actually the only Christian tenet, the only Christian doctrine that can be proved. And I think he's right. One only needs to look in the mirror. You see, none of us is sinless, none of us is innocent. But God doesn't leave us his wayward sons and daughters in the lurch. He doesn't lead us, leave us his fail, the failed kings and queens to our own devices. In Romans 5, Paul writes that while we were still weak, Christ died for the ungodly. This is one of my most favorite verses in the Bible. While we were still weak, Christ died for the ungodly. God shows his love for us that while we were still sinners, he says while we were his enemies, Christ died for us. Paul in Romans 5 then goes on to contrast two men, Adam and Jesus. And I'm paraphrasing Paul here, but he essentially says this. He says, sin and death came through one man, Adam, and through him sin passed on to all men. But forgiveness and life also come through one man, Jesus. And through faith, grace is freely passed on to all who put their trust in him. The sinless human, the sinless man dies as a substitute for sinful humans. Paul draws a clear connection and a really clear distinction between Adam and Jesus, the failed human and failed king, and the true human and the true king. And this brings us to Jesus, uh, the second person in our genealogy. And so what I want to do is look at Jesus, how he became king, and there's a hint here, it's linked to how he became fully human. So I want to fast forward to the very end of Jesus' life. The beautiful life of Jesus came to a really abrupt and violent end. He's handed over by the Jews, his own people, and he's executed by the Romans. And at the very end of Jesus' life, we see him hanging on a cross. Can anyone remember what words were written above Jesus as he was hanging on a cross? Yeah, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. This is one of my favorite paintings. It's horribly grotesque. It's pretty realistic, I think, about Jesus hanging on a cross. Um, above him, it's I-N-R-I. -I. It's just an acronym for the Latin for Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. Pretty common uh, in artistic depictions of Jesus. So after condemning Jesus to death uh, by crucifixion, in John 19, 19, we're told that Pontius Pilate, who was the governor of Judea, 
and the highest ranking Roman official in the region, he wrote an inscription. He wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. And he hung it above Jesus' body that's hanging on the cross. And Pilate wrote it in three languages. He wrote it in Aramaic, and he wrote it in Greek, and he wrote it in Latin. And he did that to cover all of his bases. He did it that way so that everyone could read it, because those were the three languages that basically everyone spoke um, during that time. So that everyone could read it and know who it was that was dying the most heinous death possible, death on a cross, the death of a criminal and the death of an enemy of the Roman state. Who was hanging on the cross was Jesus, the so-called king. And so this was an act of intimidation, hanging Jesus on the cross. It was an act of deterrence. Rome was flexing its political muscle, trying to smash a competing king to show the world who the real king was. And so I want to take a step back and talk again about the clash of kingdoms. The Old Testament is essentially a really long story about the kingdoms of the world versus the kingdoms of God. Starting out with the Egyptians, you go to the Philistines, the Assyrians, the Babylonians, the Persians, and you can throw in a couple others in there as well. And the New Testament is essentially the same thing, just a much shorter story uh, with the the same theme, the clash of kingdoms of the world versus the clash of the kingdom of God. And this time in the New Testament, it's focuses on Rome, the superpower of Jesus' day. So the kingdom of God and the kingdom of Rome are at odds with one another. They're clashing. They're at war. And that means Jesus and Caesar are at war because both claim not just some sort of provincial authority, but an ultimate authority, a cosmic authority over the entire world. In the end, there isn't room for both of them. And so to borrow a line from J.K. Rowling, it's a bit like the prophecy about Harry Potter and Voldemort. Ultimately, in the end, neither can live while the other survives. And the battle between Jesus and Caesar is even more cosmic than the battle between Harry Potter and Voldemort. So this might all sound crazy, well, comparing Jesus, and, you know, Harry Potter is essentially a a Jesus story. Um, But it might sound crazy to hear that Basically, right under the surface of the New Testament lies this cosmic political battle being waged. And so what I want you to hear, um, I want you to hear how the Romans described Caesar, a man who they viewed to be divine. And so what we're going to do is we're going to read an an inscription that was devoted to Caesar, uh, Caesar Augustus from the year 9 BC. And I want you to take what you know about Jesus, and I want you to see if you can pick out some of the competing claims Uh, that the Romans made about Caesar to what the Bible says about Jesus. So this is uh, an inscription from the ninth century. This is about Caesar. The most divine Caesar we should consider equal to the beginning of all things. For when everything was falling into disorder and tending toward dissolution, he restored it once more and gave the whole world a new aura. Caesar, the common good fortune of all, the beginning of life and vitality, All the cities unanimously adopt the birthday of the divine Caesar as the new beginning of the year. Whereas the providence which has regulated our whole existence has brought our life to the climax of perfection in giving to us the emperor Augustus, whom providence filled with strength for the welfare of men, and who being sent to us and our descendants as savior, has put an end to war and has set all things in order." And whereas, having become God manifest, Caesar has fulfilled all the hopes of earlier times. The birthday of the God Augustus has been for the whole world the beginning of good news, the word gospel concerning him. Therefore, let a new era begin from his birth. Did you all pick up on anything that might clash with what the Bible says about Jesus there? Nearly all of these things that are said about Caesar are also said about Jesus in the Bible. A man who was also divine, the beginning of all things, the restorer of order for the welfare of men, Savior. He puts an end to war, right? Jesus is the Prince of Peace. He sets all things in order. He is God manifest. And news about him is good news. It is the gospel. And so back in the day, the gospel is essentially the good news of a king who's conquered another king. That's what they would call the gospel. It is celebrating a conquering king. And so that makes us read the New Testament a little differently. For instance, in Mark 1, this is how Mark 1 begins. 
It says, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And so how we're intended to hear that is Jesus, not Caesar, brings good news. Jesus, not Caesar, is king. And so you can understand how highly controversial that is. And so even though Jesus was an obscure Jewish man in an obscure Jewish province, Jesus was perceived as a threat to Roman power and to Roman stability because of his competing claims as king. And in a really surprising way, the cross is chosen as the battleground for these two kings to see who will win the war and become the victorious conquering king. And it's on the cross where we most clearly see the difference between the earthly kingdom and the heavenly one, between Caesar and Jesus. And so in Mark 10, Jesus is talking to his disciples and they ask him a question. And he says that the rulers of the Gentiles, rulers like Caesar, they lord over their power, or they lord their power over their subjects. They maintain their power through domination and through violence. And then Jesus says, this is not supposed to uh, characterize you, my followers. It's not to be this way among you who are citizens of the city of God, where God is king. And Jesus says, but whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Rather than achieve authority through violence over his subjects, what we see Jesus does is that he achieves victory by becoming a victim of violence as a substitute for his subjects. The cross is the battleground of the competing kings between Caesar and Jesus. Rome chose to execute Jesus on a cross to prove that Jesus is not the true king. Jesus was crucified as an attempt to show that world that Jesus was a dead end and a liar and a soon-to-be-dead man. But God chose the cross to prove that Jesus is actually the way, the truth, and the life. The cross is not proof that Jesus is not the king, but it in fact is the very means by which Jesus becomes the king. You see, Pilate was a prophet, only he had no idea how right he was when he wrote, this is Jesus, king of the Jews. The cross is absolutely where Jesus crushed, or was crushed by Rome, but it also happens to be where Jesus wins. The cross is the site of Christ's coronation. It's where he becomes king and conquers sin, death, and the devil. And as I've tried to argue, to be king is none other than to be human. The cross is not only where Jesus proves himself to be king, but the whole scene leading up to his death is where Jesus is shown to be fully and truly human. As it turns out, Pilate is an unintentional prophet twice. Before he's crucified, before Jesus is crucified, Pilate has uh, his cronies put a crown of thorns on Jesus' head and they wrap a purple robe around his shoulders. And the robe is purple because that was the color of royalty, right? So they're mocking Jesus as king. And right before he's crucified, Pilate parades Jesus in front of the crowds, and this is what he says to the people. He says, behold the man. And in Latin, this is ecce homo, behold man. And there's such profound irony in this statement. Pilate is doing all this to mock Jesus as if he's saying, like, this isn't really a man. Men don't die this kind of death on a cross. Uh, but the reality is, Jesus, Pilate's actually pointing out the very first truly human being in human history. Jesus was the first human whose life was characterized not by an exaltation of self, not by rebellion, but obedience to God that expressed itself through self-sacrificial love. This is one of my favorite quotes of all time. Scott A.J. loves this quote. This is one of, our, one of our favorites. One theologian puts it this way. He says, not Adam, but Jesus was the first human being the first member of the human race in whom humanity came to fulfillment, the first human being for whom to live was simply to love. For this is what human beings are for. The supreme expression of his humanity, and I would add the supreme expression of his divinity in our kind of world is the cross. The cross is the sign that Jesus is the first really human being, the first one to live and die Surely through love, surely through radical, self-sacrificial love. 
I want to pay another visit to Mark Twain. <clears throat> Mark Twain said this. This is in an essay called The Character of Man. This is also pretty bleak. He said, if we would learn what the human race really is at bottom, we need only observe it in election times. That's true, right? You guys are watching the news, the debates. People do anything to get elected. He said, the mainspring of man's nature is selfishness. Man is what he is, lord his own, lovable to his own, his family, his friends, his tribe, and otherwise he is the buzzing, busy, trivial enemy of his race who tarries his little day, does his little dirt, commends himself to God, and then dies, goes out into the darkness to return no more and send no message back, selfish even in death. Now, this may be true of most men and women who don't love God, but it is certainly not true of Jesus. And that's because Jesus, it's not because Jesus is less human, but because he's more human. And I think this is a really key point, what I want you to get tonight. Jesus is not less human than us. He's more human than us. He's more human than we are. He is the human that Adam should have been but wasn't. Jesus is the king that Adam should have been but wasn't. And if we would learn what the human race is really like, we don't need to observe it in election times. We need to learn it, observe it in the political battle uh, the war between kings on the cross. We need to observe it in Jesus. And so I love this quote from Twain because Jesus basically disproves it completely. He flips everything about it on its head. Jesus isn't selfish in life, but he's selfless, right? He loved not only his own, but he loved his enemies, those who hated him, those who rejected him, those who killed him. And he's not selfish in death. He's selfless in death. And he didn't stay dead. He doesn't just send a message back, right? He brings a message back. And I'm talking about the resurrection. I want to talk about one of my favorite small little details in the Bible. It's so easy to look. Nearly all of the commentaries miss it. It's in the Gospel of John. And we're told in the Gospel of John that Jesus was buried in a tomb that was located in a garden, right? So after he was crucified, they took his body down and uh, they put it in this tomb. And after three days, Jesus' disciples visited the tomb, and they discovered that it was empty. And they were, had no idea why it was empty. They thought that somebody had just stolen it, and so they left. And the one remaining person at the tomb was Mary Magdalene, one of the women that followed him so faithfully in his life. And so she's outside of his tomb, and she's weeping. And here's the dialogue between Jesus and Mary Magdalene. Jesus said to her, and in the story, we know that it's Jesus that's talking to her, but Mary doesn't know who it is. Mary doesn't know it's Jesus. So Jesus said, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? And Mary, who doesn't know that the man talking to her is Jesus, says, supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. So John 20, 15, supposing him to be the gardener, why do you think this little detail so easily overlooked is in here? And I want you to think back to Adam and Eve, the first humans. What was their job? They're gardeners, right? So just as with the Garden of Eden, a garden is the site of another great reversal, this time in the New Testament. Unlike Adam, who turned the world upside down in a garden, Jesus is turning the world right side up in a garden. He's starting to make all things new in a garden. God is turning order out of chaos, order out of disordered creation. And so what I think John is saying here is that Jesus is the firstborn of a renewed humanity. As Paul put it in Colossians, right? We studied Colossians this fall. Jesus is the beginning, the firstborn of the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent, that he might be king. Jesus, the true king and the true human, gets a fresh start in the garden, and his kingdom is going to spread, develop, and progress into the great city of God. And so I think we have to ask ourselves a really important question. How is God going to accomplish his mission this time? His mission of uh, the flourishing of all creation. I think the answer is the same as it always was, as God always intended through his people, 
through a renewed people, recreated men and women, kings and queens, who rule and reign over the earth, living faithful lives according to the economy of the kingdom of God. And that brings us to us in our genealogy here, the third generation of our genealogy from Adam to Jesus to us. And I'm going to run through this a bit quicker. Tomorrow night when Scott sort of ties a neat bow and everything, he's going to talk a little bit more about what all the things we've been talking about with Jesus as priest, prophet, and king means for us, especially as it relates uh, to heading back to Princeton. But I w- what I want to say now briefly is that Jesus' lordship, Jesus' kingship, very much depends on us, a renewed humanity who take up our original calling as kings and queens on this earth in this fallen world. The only way that the good news, the only way that the gospel that Jesus is king will be believed and that the kingdom of God will spread is if we live lives that embody the values and the priority of God's kingdom. The fact of the matter is this. You can go around yelling, Jesus is king, until you're blue in the face, but unless people see that we live lives as if Jesus really is our king, people won't want anything to do with Jesus. What I'm talking about is integrity. The mission of God in the world depends upon our being men and women of integrity, men and women whose walk matches our talk, whose uh, outside lives, outer lives match our inner lives. Leslie Newbegin, he was a missionary to India for a very long time. He was a British theologian, um, wrote a bunch of really good books, and he says this. He asked the question, how is it possible that the gospel should be credible, that people should come to believe that the power which has the last word in human affairs is represented by a man hanging on a cross? He says, I am suggesting that the only answer, the only hermeneutic of the gospel is a community of men and women who not only believe that Jesus is king, but they live by it. Aristotle in rhetoric said it's not enough to know what we ought to say, we have to say it as we ought to say it. And so it's not enough to believe the gospel, we also have to live by it. And if we're not living by it, what does it say about what we believe? And so what I want to do to end my talk is basically give us a call to repent for the sake of God's mission in the world. And so I'm going to ask you a series of questions. Where is your citizenship? Where do you feel most at home, in the earthly city or in the heavenly city? Is your allegiance to Christ or to someone or something else? Is your life characterized by an exaltation of self? Are you the king of your own life? Or is your life characterized by an exaltation of Jesus as king? Can your friends and your family see the difference in your life, in how you live, in what you say, in how you spend your time, the decisions that you make, the company that you keep, how does how you live your life look different from your peers at Princeton? Can people tell that Jesus is your king? And here's where I'll end. If you're a Christian and you find yourself convicted of the fact that your primary allegiance is not to Jesus, I invite you to confess that to God and to repent, to turn away from those things that uh, are dominating your allegiance and to turn back to Christ, to turn back to Jesus, your King. And if you're not a Christian, I invite you to consider the things that you've heard about Jesus, the things that you've heard about Jesus this week. And I want you to consider placing your faith in Jesus, who is the ultimate priest, who is the prophet, who is the King and our Savior. So let's pray together.